בעזרת השם, in two weeks minus a day, it's going to be already Pesach. Pesach is one of the most powerful days of the year, that if a person prepares himself the right way in the night of Pesach, he's totally ready, he can reach one of the most highest level of a godly revelation that will affect his body, him or she, in the most powerful way. The teachings of Kabbalah explains that on the night of Pesach shines a light from Sfirat Habina, or Habina, that if a person is aligned the right way, he will be affected by this light. Then he has 49 days to go through Sfirat Omer, and if he does it, he or she, the right way, day after day, then on the night of Shavuot, will receive He'ara, shine, from the Or Yechida, which for us, how it's related with practical, is that you can either fill your tank to the fullest with the best gasoline, or you fill it empty, a half, a quarter, with milk or with water, and then the engine doesn't run well. So we want uh, the light to affect us in the most profound way. So tonight we're going to touch, tonight, <laughs> today we're going to touch a little bit, uh, briefly, the idea behind Pesach and what do I want to do on the night of Pesach itself. Because most people, comes the night of Lel Seder and they miss the whole opportunity. They're tired, they're busy with the kids, they don't focus on what's going on, but we want to make sure that you are prepared the right way and the preparation is a big part of the actual night itself. Now I need to know what needs to be done on Lel Seder. Lel Seder is not a meal. Lel Seder is not some gathering, a family gathering to catch up on uh, stories. Lel Seder should be done in the most perfect way possible and it has to be done in a way that I know what's going on and it has to be in a certain order. That's why it's called Lel Seder. Seder means order. Either that, it should have been called Lel HaMatzot, the night of uh, Matzot, or the night of freedom, or the night of four cups. Other than that, it's called Lel HaSeder, the night of Seder. Seder is order. Most people don't have order in their life. Most people, they have zero order in their life. There's no Seder. And needless to say, then life doesn't work out. A person needs a Seder in their life. Even if you go to Yeshivot, the, how they call the daily... Uh, the, the, the daily order is seder, and you can't break the seder. Once you break it, then you give opportunity to any type of disturbance to come and bother you. We talked about it two days ago, that 3,400 years ago we were stuck in Mitzrayim. Shlomo HaMelech says, Ma shaya What was, is, when will be. En chadash There's nothing new under the sun. There's no difference between us now and the Bnei Israel, the sons of Israel, 3,400 years ago. They were in Mitzrayim, we're in Mitzrayim. The only difference is that we have iPhones. That's the only difference. There's, there were slaves, we are slaves. People think that they were building pyramids in Mitzrayim. They didn't build pyramids. They were slaves exactly how we were slaves. The only difference is that we don't realize that we are exactly like them. No difference. We talked about it many times, that 80% of the Jews, did, Bnei Israel, did not want to leave Mitzrayim. Why? Because when Moshe Rabbeinu came and told them we're leaving, they asked him, tell me, is there Wi-Fi in the desert? No. Ah, no Wi-Fi, I'm staying in Mitzrayim. Sorry to tell you. Can't ch check my messages. Same thing here. The same king that ruled in Mitzrayim 3,400 years ago is the same king. Klipa, the same spiritual power that is disturbing us right now. See what we're talking about. Something always disturbs. This Klipa, this king was called Paro. Paro, if you switch the letters of Paro, the order, you get the word Hafra'a. Hafra'a means something disturbs you. Something is confusing you. Something is distracting you. This is Hafra'a. All day long we are distracted by Paro. See, this is Paro. Why? Because every two minutes it does bzz, 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 so it distracts me. Most people are so not productive because constantly there's distractions. Your phone, WhatsApp, Facebook, whatever it is, your wife calls you every two minutes. Most people, there's no seder. So, 
I don't understand even, I don't, chas v'shalom, don't want to hurt anybody, but I don't understand why people come with a phone to shul. Why do you need the phone in shul? If you work for Atzala, you're some uh, medic, fine. But why do you need the phone in shul? Who's going to call you? And why would you want to even answer? If you're going to get distracted in the middle of the tefillah by your phone, so your whole tefillah is worthless. So I need to know how to control my life that I don't have disturbances and, con and all these confusions in my life. Because most people, the paro in their life will distract them all day long. So Lel Seder is to make me have the ability, the power to focus on my life. How do I concentrate not to be disturbed? Then I become a hundred times more productive. And it doesn't matter. It can be in business. It can be in relationships. It can be in my spiritual growth. Most people, they have an hour a day to learn. Two hours a day to learn, which is nothing. Two hours a day to learn Torah is bemet nothing. You don't even warm up your engine in two hours. I, wrote, uh, I tell a lot of people, you need to learn at least two to four hours a day Torah. <laughs> two hours. If I squeeze half an hour, I'm lucky. Sure. I know people who are more busy than all of us together, and they're able to squeeze three hours a day Torah, four hours a day Torah. That's what you have to do. Learn less than that. How can you squeeze in learning Torah? If you are productive and you don't get distracted by all sorts of disturbances, you are going to be able to do a lot more. So what's the point, what is the, uh, uh, the goal that we want to achieve on El Seder? It's to go out of Mitzrayim. And it's a very important concept that we know Mitzrayim is not a country. I know that we were, so to say, physically in Mitzrayim, but Mitzrayim is not a country. Mitzrayim is Egypt, of course. Mitzrayim is a state of mind, a consciousness. Mitzrayim comes from the word in Hebrew, Meitzar. Meitzar is a limit, something that limits me. In our generation, they use a different word. People don't like hearing this word. It's called addiction. Nobody wants to hear that they're addicted to something. Everybody's addicted to at least three, four things in their life. Some things is severe, drugs, alcohol, gambling, and so forth. Some people, their addictions are not so big. Eh, coffee, their Facebook, their phone, whatever it is, their car, their business, some type of a game. Very few people are not controlled by anything in this world. And I became observant exactly 18 years ago, minus two weeks. Three years, I didn't even wear yamaka when I became observant. I used to put filin on. That was my mitzvah. Slowly, slowly, I worked w m about growing. Mainly what I focused on was kashrut, because I knew that the food is go what's going to make the difference. But the first thing that I applied in my life to, in order for me to come closer to Hashem, I was addicted to anything that existed in this world. And I could not come to terms that I can become a slave to God if I'm a slave to anything else in this world. If I'm a slave to a cigarette, to a cup of coffee, to anything, to a game, to a movie, to a movie, to a TV series, how can I be a slave to Hashem? Can't be slave to two things. Can only be slave to Hashem, and that's what we are. We're slaves to Hashem, and people don't like to hear it. But to be a slave to Hashem, and you win, you won the lottery. You know what a kavod it is to be the slave to the kadosh Boko. So the first thing that I had in my mind is I have to get rid of anything that controls me. Because if I'm not in control of my life, then how will I be able to serve the master of the universe? So my goal on Lel Seder is to go out of Mitzrayim, to go out of my state of limitation. And by the way, addictions or limitations are not necessarily something physical. I can be in a state of limitation that I have a problem with anger, and I can't control my anger. I can go out of my limitation. Any person that will throw a word, right away I get upset. This is not a normal state. Now I know many things in my life can cause me that, but I have to work on myself. And sometimes my state of limitation is because I'm very judgmental. I'm very quick to anger. I'm very jealous. Whatever it is, this is also a state of limitation. I need to know how to control my midot, my attributes. Nevertheless, what is really redemption? Because when we're talking about that, I want to go out of Mitzrayim. Is, this is the title that is called Geula. Geula is a redemption. Geula, it means that if something is in, trapped in some type of slavery or, or imprisonment, and it goes out of it. It's being revealed. If somebody's in prison, he's locked. He's confined. Redemption is to go out of it. This is the term of Geula. That's what I want to focus on Mitzrayim. Now, I have a neshama stuck in my body. 
I need to get the neshama out of its imprisonment. What is called giluya neshama, to reveal my neshama. Very few people, their neshama is begilui, revealed. Usually what is revealed is my needs of my body, my desires, my inclination, and all my midot. But to get to a point that my neshama is revealed, that's a very, very high level, and that's what I want to reach, and it's practical to any person. You don't have to become a tzaddik for that. You don't need to be born a tzaddik. Every person can come to a level that's called gilui neshama, then my neshama is revealed. When all I want is to do chesed, to learn Torah, to be close to the Kadosh Baruch Hu, to be davek ba Kadosh Baruch Hu, glued to, to Hashem, that's gilui neshama. That's what I want to reveal. Now, very important to know, my neshama is what's called chelek eloka, it's a piece of Hashem, uh, to try to uh, kind of vision the idea, the neshama is also called or, or means a light. The teachings of Kabbalah mentions the word or many, many times. It's not this or, it's not a light coming from a light bulb. Or comes from the word in Hebrew, he'ara, something that enlights. You can go now to a beautiful shiur and you're all hyped up, you're all excitement. This is he'ara. The soul has a power to touch another soul or something else and enlighten it. Most people are in darkness, their life is in darkness. Turn the lights now off, try to find your, your way around in this room. You can't, it's dark. Turn the light on, oh, now I see where everything is. Now, my soul is a little version, so to say, not to compare chas v'shalom, anything to Hashem, but I'm a mini version of Hashem. A orin sof, a light that is shining to all the distances that I, that I can just fathom, but I'm in a mini version. Very important to know my soul is pure, and it will always be pure, and it will never be able to be damaged by anything that I do. This is a misconception when people say, you do a sin, you damage your neshama. That's not right. You cannot damage your neshama. You can damage your body, you can damage your nefesh, you can damage your ruach, but you cannot damage the neshama. A person does a sin, the neshama is removed. Not to be damaged. But, nevertheless, it can be affected. The neshama will get overwhelmed and affected by my action. But important to know that it doesn't get nifgemet, doesn't have a pgam. Pgam means a, a ty type of a blemish. A blemish. What, what's the word you use? Defect. A defect. Yeah, blemish I think is a better word. The neshama cannot be blemished. Now, what's the difference between one person to another? Is that how much my soul is shining. That's the only difference. I know people that came from the depth of the depth of the depth. Depth I'm talking about in this world, from mafia, drugs, Hashem from where now you look at them, oh, pillar of light. The difference between us is how much the neshama is shining. When I became observant, I went through different yeshivot. So one of the yeshivot where I stopped was somewhere in Brooklyn. And we were always making a fun. You go to the showers, it looked like jail. Everybody's tattoos. He holes everywhere, but nothing. I mean, the, the middles are out, but still there's holes. The, the, the shower looked like jail. Everybody during the day with yarmulkes and peot and beards and learning Torah, take the jackets off. Ooh, where did you come from? <laughs> so the only difference from us, and you know what? And some people are born into Kedusha. And you know, this is, uh, I, I sad to say, but there are many people that celebrate Purim every day. To buy a suit is very, is very easy, put a beard on is very easy. So people get impressed by the chitzoniyut, by the external part. So it took me, I think, about five years to change my dress. I was like, I am not going to be dressed like the rest of the herd. Later on, oh, that took a long time. One of the yeshivot that I went to, they told me, you can't be dressed like this here. And I told the Rosh Yeshiva, are you here to teach me Torah? You teach me fashion or how to get dressed. I do not want to be dressed like all the rest of the students. My tshuva is not a jacket. My tshuva is to refine my neshama. If this is not applicable in this yeshiva, I don't want to be here even. So just to make a conclusion, the difference between us is how much the neshama is shining. You can't look at a person and conclude where the person is holding, the external part is, is nothing, doesn't say anything. I want to get to a point that my neshama is shining out. I will be affected, my wife or my husband will be affected, not my, I don't have one, but 
for the ones that uh, do have one. My kids will be affected, my surrounding will be affected, my community. <coughs> I have to understand, I live inside a goof, in a body. We're all living in a body. I don't know anybody who is living without a body. And the body is built from the desire for pleasure. That's how the body is. The body is already designed in a certain way. The body is designed that it needs pleasure. It wants pleasure. It's called ta'anug. There's a pleasure coming from something spiritual. We don't feel that. Some tzaddikim, they will learn Torah and they will receive unbelievable pleasure. We don't do that. I never saw a person putting tefillin on and fainting on the floor. <coughs> Why? Because the body is a barrier between the neshama and my actions. But the body is designed for pleasure. And we constantly go after pleasure. And this, of course, physical pleasure. This is called a te'ava, a desire. There's a te'ava for eating, te'ava for procreating, te'ava for money. There's all sorts of te'avot. Everybody has a certain te'ava that they have to refine. But this is coming mitzad aguf. It's coming from the body, not from the, from the neshama. The neshama has nothing to do with te'avot. The only thing the neshama wants is only Torah and mitzvot. Now, once the soul is shining in me, and it's revealed in me, which is, this is the point that I want to get, then my entire retzon, my desire, changes, completely changes. Not only that, my midot change. Because if my desire is to have physical pleasure, the midah will be aligned with it. Midah is an attribute, or my characteristic. Once my neshama is shining, my midot is completely different. <coughs> This is not for now to talk about, but this is a big thing that most people miss in their spiritual refinement. Later on, if you want, take this specific CD, Tikkun Amidot. I talked about it many, many times in many of my classes. One of the greatest teachers of all time of Kabbalah, of course, is the Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, the Arizal. His main student, Rabbi Chaim Vital, has a book called Sha'are Kedusha, Gates of Holiness. We started learning it in my shiva. This is a, a basic book that everybody has to learn. I know it's a, a, a sound like a terrifying book. It's this big. It's not a book of Kabbalah. It's kind of a, like a, more like a Kabbalistic Musar. But he starts the book by saying something very, very interesting. He says, of course we need to follow the Torah. No question here. We need to learn Torah, do mitzvot, no, no doubt. But this is not the main thing in my life. The main thing in my life is to refine myself. And he calls it tikkun amidot, refining my characteristics and my attributes. There are many different approaches to that. The Gaon from Vilna, for example, he calls it leshaberet amidot, break the midot. The Bar Shem Tov also has a certain approach. There's different approach how to do it, but the fact is that each and every one of us is born with some good character traits and bad character traits. I need to realize what my good character traits so I can feed them and empower them, and I need to know what are my bad character traits so I can refine them. Now, if I have a problem with anger, it doesn't mean I'm a bad person. It just means that is what I need to refine. If I have a problem with being judgmental, being cheap, being quick to judge, have jealousy, these are all bad midot, and I have to refine it. So when I shine my neshama, by default, my midot will change. My desires, what I want, instead of running to have breakfast after I finish eating, again, no offense, I'm not trying to hurt anybody. Instead of running to the kitchen, ah, I'm going to stuff myself with a sandwich. No, I want to sit and learn now for two hours. You want to eat? No, I eat. What's eating? Let me learn for two hours. My desire changes for everything. You want to go to sleep? No, I don't want to go to sleep. I want to sit and learn for an hour. I want to do some chesed. I want to be inspired. So this is one thing also that I want to get to. Now, the neshama, it gets, uh, so to say, concealed by the chomer, by the physicality. You don't see a neshama. If somebody comes and tells you, I see a neshama, then they're 100% not connected to reality or they're lying to you. No, no such a thing. Only a tzaddik can look at you and see your neshama. If we would be able to see each other neshamot, then we would know a lot about each other. But the goof, the, the, the material, it covers the neshama. So you also don't see the neshama and you also don't feel the neshama. And what is controlling the neshama is the desire of my body. And again, my body wants to eat, it wants to sleep, it wants to procreate, it wants to do many other things. Now, 
most of my desires, most of my ambitions, most of my ideas and thoughts are not even mine. It's the goof. It's the body. It has nothing to do with me. I will come up with a bold idea, the million dollar idea. Why? Because I want money. Why? Because I want to enjoy life. I once spoke to a certain individual who was a very successful lawyer. And I told him, just to make a point, I told him, do you like what you do? He's like, ah, well, I told him, it's between us. You don't have, it's, the camera's not recording. Do you like what you do? He's like, no, I don't really like it. I said, then, so why are you a lawyer? Well, he said, well, I make a lot of money. So I said, do you like making money? Or do you like fighting for justice? He's like, well, between us, it's money. He says, okay. So you're not here for the justice. You're here for the money. Why do you like money? Do you like doing chesed with your money? Do you build yeshivot, orphanages, feed for poor people? Why do you need so much money? So he says, well, to be honest, we're now honest. He's like, I like nice cars. Ah, so you like nice cars. You don't like the money, you like the car, but you need the money to buy the car. Now, why do you like nice cars? You like f driving fast? He's like, well, no, with a nice car you get the girls. He says, ah, so you like the girls. So you need the money to get the girls, the car to get the girls, and how do you get the car? You need the money. And then you need a stinky job that you don't like. Now, why do you want the girls? Well, you know, when you're with a girl, then I enjoy myself. Ah! So you want to pleasure yourself. So you need a girl for that. And how do you get the girl? With a nice car. How do you get the nice car? You need money. How do you get the money? Well, you have a job you can't stand for 40 years. So that's why you're willing to spend five years in university, 40 years in a job you don't like, to get the money, to get the car, to get the girl, so you can pleasure yourself. See? So, and that's individually to, for him, but every person can look in their life so my ideas, my desires, my thoughts, my ambitions, it's for my own desire. That has to be recalculated. If I can go back, backtrack on this, where is that to do with my life, then you see something went wrong somewhere. Now I have to go steps back to see how am I correcting that. Because I do not want to be controlled my, by my desire. I don't want my drive to be some idea in the back of my head. How am I getting this? So I need to go through different steps. How to get something that I want. So at the end of the day, it all boils down to how do I pleasure myself. Right? That's how it is. Now, our soul is in a body. The, the idea, the concept of soul being a body is called neshama beguf, this is called gelut, this is called an exile. This is called gelut mitzrayim, that I went down to a place of mitzrayim. What is gelut mitzrayim? It's Yaakov and his 12 sons going down to mitzrayim. That's how it all started. Yaakov was living fine in Eretz Israel, everything was going good. Yosef was sold down to mitzrayim, the Egyptians took him, you know the whole story, blah, 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 and then Yaakov comes down with all the kids. That's his gelut mitzrayim. What are, why, what's Yaakov and what's the 12 kids? We have 12 powers in my neshama. That's why there are 12 kids for Yaakov Avino. Not 13 and not 14 and not 11. And by the way, just for, the, for what they say for the record, Yaakov Avino has 25 kids, not 12 kids. Because with every boy was born a twin girl. And then he has Dina, the 15th, uh, like the, the 13th girl, so to say. So we have 25 kids. Why 12 kids? Why is the Torah is talking about the 12 kids of Yaakov Avinu? Because the, we have 12 powers in our soul. This is 12 kochot nefesh. Mitzrayim, Egypt, is compared to my body. That's my body. The desires, these lusts, that I, strong lusts that I have from the body, is to enjoy the moment. I have a cake, right away I enjoy the cake. I have a, whatever it is, a movie, a good meal, Marital relations, it's right now. I want to enjoy right now. I'm uh, and <laughs> yeah. Now, this is the complete opposite from the nature of the neshama. Neshama is not looking for an instant, instant gratification, and definitely not from something that will not last more than a few minutes or a few hours or a few days. Neshama doesn't, doesn't even bother the neshama. Neshama doesn't care about things like this. Rather, the neshama in the body is, is numb. 
Exactly like a person goes to the dentist, they give him an injection, and the lips now is numb now for three hours, and the Shema is numb in the body. It doesn't, sometimes it doesn't feel anything, it doesn't react to anything, and this is a very, this is a big problem in a state of, of, of exile. Now, going out of Mitzrayim, we couldn't talk a lot about in, during Pesach, and I'm sure you heard the concept, Yetziat Mitzrayim, going out of Mitzrayim, this is revealing my Neshama. If your Neshama is not revealed in your life, then you're going to be sad, miserable, depressed, unhealthy, unhappy, things not going to wor work out, confused, confusion, and so forth, and the list will go on and on. Why? Because my Neshama is not revealed. It's not about being dressed in black, long beard, peot, and praying all day long. People see the Torah in a completely different way. I need the Torah, I need to reveal my Neshama so I can have a good, healthy, happy, successful, normal life. So Yetziat Mitzrayim is revealing the Neshama. This cannot work together. Kedusha and Tum'ah cannot come together. Kedusha, holiness, Tum'ah, impurity cannot coexist. You're either in Kedusha or you're either in Tum'ah. There's no other way. Some people switch from Tum'ah and Kedusha a hundred times a day. In the morning they're sitting in a Bet Knesset, Kedusha. They go out, whoop, something catch catches their eye, Tum'ah. He does tshuva right on the spot. Boom, kedusha. Going backwards and forth from kedusha and tuma. Most people, they juggle from side to side. Very few people have this chut to sit all day long and be just in kedusha. Mind in kedusha, eyes in kedusha, everything in kedusha. But they cannot coexist. They, they, they don't work together. You can't be tameh and tahor at the same time. Now, in a very general way, we have to do a tikkun. A rectification. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about Gilgul Neshamot, about uh, incarnations, and a little bit the concept. Many people think that tikkun, the Gilgul Neshamot is a punishment. It's, uh, I would say, 15% punishment, 85% it's a tikkun. Tikkun means a rectification from previous lives and so forth. But, in very, very general, I need to do a tikkun, a very general tikkun. What's the tikkun that I need to do about the pleasures that will cover the neshama in this world? Anything that I feed of pleasure in this world will cover my neshama in this world. This will be the, the result. And needless to say, if my neshama is covered, it, why is it important for me to understand that my, if my neshama is covered or not? If I feel in any type of a way emptiness in my life, my neshama is covered. If I'm sad for one second in my life, my neshama is covered. If I'm depressed, angry, whatever it is, it means only my neshama is covered. You ever saw a tzaddik sitting like this? <laughs> tzaddik is all the time besimcha. Why? Neshama is not covered. So I need to constantly understand how is my neshama covered and how am I revealing it. And this is again, this is not only happening on Pesach. Pesach is the time when I draw the power. If I have this power with me, every day I can go out of Mitzrayim. And every day I will fight this Mitzrayim. Now, if my Neshama is not revealed, then there won't be any type of, any type of sensitivity to the spiritual world. That's why my entire desire, my entire focus is how am I revealing my Neshama. Now, unfortunately, my Neshama all our neshamot is covered with a klipa. Klipa is a spiritual husk, a certain energy. The more of a road that I do, the more klipot I'm covered. And I am covered, how would I know how much I'm stuck in a klipa? Depending how much te'avot I have. The more te'avot I have, te'avah is a lust or a desire, especially for something forbidden. Because I can have te'avah for something forbidden, like food, for something that is allowed to. I'm a, food, food is allowed to eat, but I can still have a te'avah for food. And, when I eat all day long. But, according to the amount of te'avot that I have, that's how much my neshama is covered. If a person has a lot of te'avah, means the neshama is stuck in a lot of klipot. And other people think they got out of the klipa, if, but if you have a te'avot, you're, not, you're still stuck in a klipa. Now, again, the desire for materialism is not only food, money, marital relations, there are many, many other te'avot. This is the ones that we relate with, because we're battling with it on a daily basis. But, for example, also pride is a teava. I want, uh, I want everybody to like me. I want to be there when I walk in, everybody's like, wow, wow, look, walked in, wow, wow. 
you're so amazing. Whatever it is. I'm still throwing one example out of many. Kaas, anger is also a teava. It's all part of teavot. So it can be, again, it can be jealousy. All, any midara'a, any bad attribute, that's already a problem. It means that it's covering the neshama and I'm in exile. If I have a problem with anger, I get angry right now. If you got angry for anything right now, your neshama is in Mitzrayim. Because if your neshama was revealed, you would never ever get angry at any situation. You would accept the situation exactly how it is. See the ashgacha pratit, doesn't affect you. So I need to understand when I'm in Mitzrayim and how I'm going out of Mitzrayim. If a person did not realize in his life that he's in Mitzrayim, that he's so deep in Mitzrayim that he thinks that he's not. So we want to see how am I going out of Mitzrayim. It's not about putting somebody down. It's not about insulting anybody. It's not about a power trip. It's about practical. How do I go out of Mitzrayim? I'm sure you heard about the famous quote from Chazal. Bechol dor vador, every generation, chayav adam lirot atzmo. Every person has to see himself. Kilu hu yatsam in Mitzrayim. Like as if he went out of Mitzrayim. The Balatanya says, lo bechol dor vador, not every day. Bechol yom vayom. Every day you have to see yourself, how do I go out of Mitzrayim? And you have to look back at yesterday, am I better than yesterday? No, I'm still in Mitzrayim. And every day I have to go out of Mitzrayim. This is, this is if you notice, when we say Shema Israel, we're talking about Yetziat Mitzrayim. We pray Shacharit, Yetziat Mitzrayim. You say Birkat Amazon, Yetziat Mitzrayim. Kiddush on Shabbat, Yetziat Mitzrayim. Zecher Yetziat Mitzrayim. Zecher Yetziat Mitzrayim. How many times do you say that? To remember the going out of Egypt. Not because we went out of Egypt 3,400 years ago. We had a lot of miraculous things in our nation for the last 4,000 years. Tziat Mitzrayim is what I need to focus on on a daily basis. That's why I am in this world, to so go out of my own Mitzrayim. If you're able to go out of Mitzrayim, then you are free. So, Nisan is called the month of Geula. Can I ask a question? How do you get out of those clip when, when your Neshama is covered? That's what we're going to talk about now. We're going to go through, now I'm kind of making a quick uh, introduction. introduction. Then we're going to talk about in Pesach what I need to focus on. And the conclusion will be, how do I go out of, out of my own Mitzrayim? So, you can't do it on an everyday basis? I mean, no, you want to do it on a, not on an everyday basis, on an every minute basis. A person can be in Mitzrayim every day and go out of Mitzrayim ten times a day. One, one Mitzrayim is my desire for food. One Mitzrayim is because I look at a woman. Another Mitzrayim is I'm running after money, whatever it is. But we are constantly in Mitzrayim. And again, remove the word Mitzrayim. We're using the word Mitzrayim, but some people, you say Mitzrayim, they're imagining pyramids. It's nothing to do with the country. It's nothing to do with pyramids. Mitzrayim comes from the word in Hebrew, Meitzar. Meitzar is something that Short. constricts me or contracts me. Self-imprisonment. Exactly. Confinement, self-imprisonment. That's why David Emelach says, Min ha-meitzar karatiya. That's when I start calling Yudkei. Because I'm in the Meitzar, I'm already <coughs> stuck there. So now we're in the month of Nisan. I mean, not yet. Hashem, this Shabbat is going to be Rosh Chodesh Nisan, one of the most powerful days of the year. Falls on Shabbat, double power. Don't miss up the opportunity. But Nisan is the month of Gula, the month of redemption. It has an energy. This is the energy of the month. We're going to talk about it with Hashem Motzei Shabbat. The energy of the month is to Take something out of something. If you know how to take something out of something, you are a winner. Most people don't know how to take something out of something. Now, just to give an example of what it means to take something out of something, I'm not taking, talking about opening a jar of olives and taking an olive out of the jar. It's not what I'm talking about. You can sit in a situation, and you can, I'll say it in Hebrew, then translate, L'hotzi davar mi davar, is to see a situation and what do I take out of it? What do I learn from it? What's my conclusion? And this is one example of many. I can sit in a shiur Torah a whole hour, walk out of the door, I didn't get nothing out of this shiur Torah. I have to take something out of this hour and then separate it. To be able to do a separation, or the biblical word to it, or the Kabbalistic word to it, is called birur. Birur is sifting. Take the good out of the bad. So uh, Nisan has the power and the energy to take something out of something. So 
I have to understand that when my neshama is in my body, stuck in the body, I need to know how to be able to get the neshama out of the meitzar of the body. You can't take the neshama out of the body. Oy vavoy if you take the neshama out of the body. The body will fall on the floor faster than what you can blink. Chas v'shalom. But I need to know how to take the neshama mim meitzar. From a limitation, from something that limits me. That is also meitzar, is a limitation. But in Hebrew, metzer is something that bothers me. Tzara. I'm sure you know the name tzara, but it comes from the root metzer. Or metzerli. When, some, when somebody is go, doing something bad to me, the proper Hebrew is to say, hu metzerli. He's making it hard for me. He's making sorrow for me. Now, the body is completely disconnected from the infinite light of Hashem, what's called Oren Sof. The soul is what's connecting me to the Kadosh Baruch Hu. The body will separate me from Hashem, the Neshama will connect me from Hashem, to Hashem. That's how it works. Now, every person has a mitzvah in the beginning of the year to get his portion out. Now, I know a lot of people, when I say the beginning of the year, shh, they jump now six months forward to Rosh Hashanah. It's not the beginning of the year. Rosh Hashanah is the seventh month of the year. This Shabbat is Rosh Hashanah. It's the real Rosh Hashanah. Right? Because Aleph Nisan is the beginning of the year. Nisan is the first month of the year. There's an argument in the Talmud between Tuta Naim, Rabbi Yudah and Rabbi Meir, when they argue, when is Rosh Hashanah? One opinion says Rosh Hashanah is Aleph Nisan, one opinion says Rosh Hashanah is Aleph Tishrei. The Arizal says they're both right. Because Aleph Tishrei is the Rosh Hashanah is when the world physically was created. But Aleph Nisan is when the Neshama of the world was created, the spiritual part of the world. So now this Shabbat, the first day of the year, I have a mitzvah, an actual commandment to take my portion out. Veten chelkenu betoratecha. Give me my portion. I have a portion here. Now, like I said before, we have a paro in our life. Uh, the word in Hebrew is called zimzumim. Zzzz, also the noises in my ears. It can be, in our generation, it's called ringtones. <laughs> <laughs> but also the noises that distract me all day long. It can be my phone, can be whatever, the doorbell. They're constantly there's rash. It's something that takes me out of my concentration. This noise. Now when my neshama is being distracted from all these things, it hides, so to say. It cannot handle situations like that. That's why in our generation, they didn't have that 50 years ago. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have social media. They didn't have all sorts of uh, communication systems like phones, messengers, and so forth. Can you imagine how relaxed their brain was? Don't go so far. 20 years ago, who had a cell phone? We had be uh, beepers. And that was, ooh, you were like so professional. Had a beeper. Oh, remember the beepers. But any the way, the neshama will hide itself. Then month of Nisan is the time when you have a auspicious time for a revelation, to reveal the neshama, to take the neshama out of its imprisonment. That's why I said before, min hamitzar karatiya. When do you call Hashem? When you, it's the most auspicious time to call Hashem, when you are the most confined, when you are most under a mitzar. Mitzar is also in Hebrew, Meitzar is also a Mekom Tzar, a place that is very, very narrow, that it's very hard to go through. This is difficulties that we have in our life. People have difficulties with Parnasa. People have difficulties to find their other half. People have difficulties with, with, the, with their children. Whatever it is, this is Mekom Tzar, something that is very, very tight. I see it as a burden instead of seeing it as a potential of growing. But... When I'm in a place like this, no satisfaction. People are depressed, sad. Their energy is down. They don't get any satisfaction. How many times a day, a week, a week, a month, a year, you are really satisfied with what you did? How you handle the situation. Most people, they don't handle a situation the right way. And after the situation is over, for three days, they ponder. Why didn't I say this? Why didn't I say that? I should have done this. I should have done that. What if I would do this? You're not satisfied with your situation. How many, count how many times you're satisfied. And there's nothing wrong with being satisfied. If you handle a situation the right way, you want to have what's called sipuk. I want to be satisfied. I'm still stuck in this place. No completion. Nothing is good. Nothing is positive. 
That's the problem with most people, by the way. You're looking at people from the outside, people's life look normal. But the reality inside, what a storm of emotions is. On the outside, you look at people, life is usual, people look f happy, people smile. 90% of it is all fake. You know when you measure the reality? Late at night, lights are off, blanket is on the head, then the person is a completely different person. They don't feel whole, they don't feel complete, they don't feel satisfied. Honey, you okay? Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. And, but inside, oh. So I want to get out of it. This is part of my mitzrayim. This is not, I, I am, by the way, you do not get unhappy if you have financial issues. A lot of people have financial problems. That's what's not going to cause you to be happy or unhappy, by the way. It's in the Shema. I know people that have severe financial issues or any other problems, but the Shema is happy, they're not unhappy. Okay, they have a challenge. Fine. It doesn't affect their state of happiness. Now, when does the Geula come? When does the redemption come? And I'm not talking about the coming of Mashiach. I'm talking about my own Geula. Is when I start screaming. In situations like this, I have to start screaming. Not screaming like a cuckoo in the street. Ah! Screaming, Lizok. Um, when is the redemption come? My gula is when I start screaming. What do I scream? What is the idea of screaming? I have nobody to count on but my Father in Heaven. I cannot count on anybody around me to solve my problems. It's only the Kadosh Bucho. And when I put all my trust in Hashem, because I have nobody else to trust, then Hashem takes care of my problems. When you scream out to Hashem. When you scream out to Hashem. Screaming to Hashem can be tefillah, can be prayer, can be reading Tehillim, can be going to the, next to the train, and when the train passes and nobody will hear you, you scream out your lungs, whatever it is. But the Akka is that I can't take it anymore. That's why it says in Mitzrayim, they couldn't take it anymore, they started screaming. How about if you scream from happiness? You can scream from whatever you want, as long as you scream. You can scream from happiness, but here, now, we're talking mainly when I'm not happy, when things don't work out. Okay has to be a tzaka. Can and you scream inside? Like yeah, you, yeah. Like but uh, physically, we'll always, always when you do something physically in an external way, it, it has an effect. But the idea is not necessarily now the actual scream. I will change. See, in, in English, sometimes it's hard to teach concepts from the Torah. Because in Hebrew, the, there's a two different words between tzaka and zeaka. Tzaka, ah! Ze'aka is, is when I scream out for help. I don't have to scream out with my voice. It can be an action. It can be an a, a, a emotion. So, excuse me? Bechi is crying. Crying is something else. Sometimes we are required to cry, require, to cry. Sometimes we're not allowed to cry. You are required to cry on the destruction of the temple. But you can't cry because you didn't win the lottery. Or because your favorite uh, team, the, what are they called here, the Miami Hits, when they lose. You don't have to cry for that. That's nonsense. That's not Bechi. But the point is that I have to, have to do an action. That's the point. The point is I cannot be passive. I have to, to make an action and not to take it lightly headed. If I am going through a severe or even a light emotional, uh, personal, physical, whatever problem, it cannot be uh, ignored. So, well, how do I get out of it? Usually when you have a problem, what do you do? You go and look for advice. Some people will go to their rabbi. Some people will go to their father. Some people will go to the Kadosh Baruch Hu Hashem, send me the message. I need a direction. The wife, the wife. The wife, the, the whatever it is. <laughs> as long as you have somewhere to get kivun, good. There's no rules here, but... If I'm now going in the car and I don't have a destination, I will 100% get lost. I need a target. In Hebrew, it's called kivun. Kivun means a direction. Where am I going? But I'm sure you're familiar with the word kavana. Kavana is an intention. But it's really, this is again where English is not a good language to teach Torah. Because kavana, to have tefillah be kavana, it doesn't mean that I have the right intention. Kavana means that my tefillah has a destination. Where is my tefillah going to? In Hebrew, it's called kivun, right? Kavana, I have to, to aim on something. Path, no? Path is, uh, will be more of a derech. 
But kavana is I have to have a kivun. I have to know where I'm going. Where am I going with my tefillah? Did you ask yourself in the morning before you put tefillin on, where am I going with this tefillah right now? Or you just came here because somebody told you it's good to pray or because everybody's praying? If you don't have a kavana when you start praying, where are you going to? If you if you investing something in this world, has to be a target, a matara. Same thing with it. What's my tefillah be kavana? Where's my tefillah taking me? Has to take me somewhere. So, the kivun that I need is I need a personal redemption. This is called gula pratit. Most people are stuck in exile. They need a, 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 a geula, a redemption, a personal redemption. Now, I need the right directions. I need to get the good, good advice, what it's called. Then I know how to get my neshama out of prison. If I don't know how to get my neshama out of prison, then I have a problem. How do I start? When is the beginning to all this? This coming Shabbat on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. That's when I start. Now I have a countdown, a 15-day countdown. Some kehilot, they have the custom that every day on Nisan, they read the Nasi of the month. They read a portion because there was an inauguration of the Mishkan. So some people have the custom of reading the, it's called Parashat Nesim. Every day they read out of the Torah. Not from the Torah, they don't take the Torah out, but they read the portion from the Torah, 12 days, then the 13th day, there's a different part that you read, then already on the 14th day, you're already in, in getting ready for Pesach. But I need a real good preparation to get me there. Rosh Chodesh Nisan, Nisan it starts, then comes Pesach. Pesach, the night of Pesach, I said already, it's called Lel Sedel, the night of Sedel, of order. It has 15 steps, 15 levels that I have to go through on the night of Pesach. If you miss one, if you mix it up, you messed it up. It has to be by the order. Now, 15 levels in one night? Yeah, yeah. 15, uh, the, when, when I'm going through, we're going to go through it right now and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean. But when you're doing the Seder in Pesach, you have to go through order. Kadesh, Karuchatz. Karpas, Yachatz, right? We have to go through it. We're going to go through it now. But this is the order that I go to. Fifteen steps I have to go through. Right? If I missed one, I didn't do anything. So have to go through the order. You messed up everything? If you, you messed up everything. If you messed one, or missed one, then you messed it up. That's why Pesach, you don't have to be a big Mekubal. You don't have to be a Baba Sali to understand what you're doing. You just need to follow the orders. So we have a book, Haggadah Shel Pesach. Written by Eliyahu Navi. This is instructions. Do one, then next, then next. I have to go through 15 stages, 15 shlavim, 15 madrigot. Kadesh, number one. Uchatz, number two. We're going to go through it now to understand that you have a little bit of an idea of what we need to do on Pesach. Bezad Hashem, then we can conclude what we need to do. So, first of all, important to know, everything starts the night before. The night when I burn the chametz. If I miss that, then I miss the whole preparation. For now, we start cleaning the house. I told you already many times, you don't have to become fanatic and start cleaning chandeliers. The chandeliers, if they're dirty, clean them. There's no chametz on the chandeliers. I didn't see anybody ever sat, sitting with a, a slingshot and throwing chametz on the chandelier. Two or three days, you can clean the whole house for Pesach, unless you actually have dinner in your closet. People clean the closets like as if you're having breakfast in the closet. You don't have breakfast in the closet. You have breakfast in the, in the kitchen. Okay, I understand. Spring, whatever, clean the house, grood. You clean the house, chick chak. Uh, I mean, the point is that you can't have chametz in the house. Completely you can't have chametz. But the cleaning is more inside my neshama. There are two important things that I need to follow on Pesach, is that I have to completely destroy any chametz. Why? Chametz means anything that is evil in me. That's what the Zohar says. Chametz is my yetzer hara. Clean out the, yes, the chametz, I'm cleaning out the yetzer hara from me. So this is called lashbit chametz. I have to destroy any chametz that I have. And then, of course, not to have the chametz throughout the Pesach. Seven days, I'm required. Seven days, not because uh, it took them seven days to go out from Mitzrayim till they crossed the Yamsof. <laughs> seven days, because it corresponds to seven levels in my neshama, corresponding to the sfirot, not the actual neshama. Chesed gvorat eferet netzachot yesod malchot then that's what I need to go out from and to refine. Now, 
What do we eat on Pesach? We eat matzah. That's the food of the holiday. Matzah is representing the Yetzir Tov. Chametz is the Yetzir Ara. Matzah is the Yetzir Tov. In case you haven't noticed, bread and matzah is the same ingredients. Flour and water, same thing. But one of them is called chametz and it's yetzera, one is called uh, uh, matzah and it's a yetzer tov. Now, if matzah is such a good thing and it's representing the yetzer tov, the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi Lazar, told, asked his father, why don't we eat matzah all day long? Why isn't that our food? Right? If it's such a great thing and chametz is bad, let's eat all year long matzah. What's so bad with it? So the point is, the answer he got that our matara, our achievement, our goal is to transform the yetzer hara into yetzer tov. So what's up if I have only yetzer tov, only matzah, what am I going to transform? So I have to remember I cannot eat chametz for seven days. You here suffer, you are eight days, right? We eat seven days in Eretz Israel. Here you have an extra day. When I don't eat chametz for seven days, this is my injection, so to say. I don't want to use the word vaccine or vaccinate. People start getting very confused now with this word. But in Hebrew, it's called chisun. Chisun is shani mechasen atzmi. I'm making myself stronger and immune. So the seven days of matzah is my immune against the yetzer in me, any type of evil in me. If you don't focus now seven days on Pesach about the matzah, you don't have an immune system for the rest of the year. So this whole next three weeks are vital to my annual existence. Again, the matzah will be my immune system for the evil in me for the rest of the year. So now, let me get this straight. These, uh, these days of Pesach, you basically have armor for the rest of the whole year. That's what you're saying. The fact that you work on your Yitzhak on those days is going to last the whole year? Is that what you're saying? Not that you... Do you always have to work on it? No. <clears throat> the... It's not that you work on your Yitzhak on Pesach. Pesach is the time that gives you the power to work on your Yitzhak throughout the entire year. So it's giving me armor, basically. It's giving me protection. you got to work on it, though. A hundred percent. You have so to so work on it. mean throughout the year it's going to be easier? No. I mean, you have the tools. No, I don't take my words out of context, but I'm just going to give an example because it's not something I, I support or believe. But people get uh, uh, vaccines to protect themselves, or to immune themselves from a disease, right? My body has an immune system. If I will damage my immune system, my body cannot fight against diseases. If I strengthen my immune system, it will fight any disease. By default, we are healthy people. You know that 99% of the diseases we have is because I disturb my body to fight diseases. Right? I'm not talking about uh, some diseases has nothing to do with me. And by the way, and again, this is not the time to teach it, people still think up until today that viruses create diseases. Viruses do not create diseases. <laughs> Toxins create diseases. But anyway, this is not the class right now to talk about it. But I have a very sophisticated immune system in my body. My body can cure anything. Why doesn't my body do it? Because I disturb my body. I put sugar in my body. I put white flour in my body. I put chemicals in my body. So forth. So my body does not have an immune system, so it breaks down. That's how it is. I need a spiritual immune system. Pesach is when I take in my body immune system, which means that throughout the year, I have tools how to fight the Yetzer Hara. I have tools how to go out of my sadness, depression, anxieties, fears, worries, and so forth. Doesn't mean there's not going to be a battle throughout the year. Oh, there'll be a battle. But uh, you go on a battle. You need weapons. You need tools. You need a plan. You need a kivun. You need the pow. Kivun, you mean the, the target, the... the the tools. Pesach is the time where I load my body with an immune system. How? I eat matzah. But it's not only about eating the matzah, it's everything around it. So, so you don't do everything around it. You're not going to have tools? You're not going you're to gonna be body. very weak throughout the entire year. If you don't do anything what you need to do on Pesach, 90% of the battles with you in the Yetzirah, you'll win. You'll lose.
If you don't take this immune system throughout Pesach, <coughs> most of the battles you're going to have with the Yetzirah throughout the year, you won't have the right tools to fight him. You're not going to be able to deal with the Yetzirah throughout the year. He will have the upper hand. And then you don't go out of Mitzrayim, you have to wait for the next year. Why do we say, always oh, it's Lashana Abba Yerushalayim? Next year in Yerushalayim, why? You want to live in Yerushalayim? What's wrong with Tzfat? <laughs> There are many nice cities in Israel. Why Shana Ba Yerushalayim? The Shana Ba, if I didn't go out this year out of my Mitzrayim, then Shana Ba will have to, I have to wait for the next year to go out of Mitzrayim. And we said at the end of the Seder, because if I went throughout the Seder, already at the end of the Seder I went out of Mitzrayim. Most people at the end of the Seder are already too full from so much chicken or meat and roast they already ate. They can't even barely say the Hallel and they don't even finish the Haggadah. Most people don't finish the Haggadah. You know that the most important part of the Agadah is after the meal. People ah, ah, stuff themselves with, eat a little bit of whatever food, and then move on with the rest of the Agadah. So let me just go through over the order that we're doing now, then Bezad Hashem will do some questions and answers, and Bezad Hashem will go uh, <laughs> more practical. But, again, going back to what we were saying, seven days I cannot eat chametz. That's my immune system for the rest of the year against the Yetzirah, against the any evil in me. I have a lot of evil in me, by the way. We all have evil in me. Why? Because I feed it. So I need to be immune. Now, why chametz? Why dafka chametz? Why couldn't it be an apple? Or a banana? Why dafka chametz? So, the first sin in the Torah, a lot of people, there's arguments, what's the first sin? But in general, the first sin in the Torah, I'm, why am I saying an argument? Because many people will say that Adam and Chava ate from the tree. But some will argue and say, but the first prohibition is not to eat from the tree. But the fact that they ate it, that makes it the first sin that they didn't listen. The action was eating, but they didn't listen to the Kadosh Baruch Hu. But the first sin in the Torah, the title of it, was that they wanted to get more than what they needed. Adam HaRishon missed anything. He had the whole world. He had a whole Gan Eden with thousands of trees. Why do you have to have Dafka this tree? The desire to take something more than what I need. Excess, Excess. Excess yeah. Mutarot in Hebrew. Too much. What's wrong with what you have? You have to have another, uh, how do you call it here in this world? Uh, uh, you go to the dinner... They give you more, how do you call it? The uh, refill. Refill. Why do you need a refill? You had already a whole, like now they have buffets, everybody's going for Pesach. You can die just from what they give you. This is not, this is not Pesach. I was once uh, in one of these uh, places. Every two hours is a meal. But nevertheless, <laughs> we're not going to talk about this. So, what was the sin in Mitzrayim? Is that in uh, the first sin in Gan Eden, is that they wanted to get more than what they needed. Apply this to your life. If you need to take one thing out of this class, don't take more than what you need. We talked about it in the beginning in the morning, about food. You don't need to eat a lot. You need this much. You don't need to eat a lot. You don't need a lot of anything. But we constantly want more than what I actually need. That was the first thing in, 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 uh, in the Torah. Now when I take something that I don't need, what happens to it? It becomes a Yetzirah. End of story. So remember the equation. You take something more than what you need, it becomes a Yetzirah. I take food for my uh, existence, that's it. Start so shoving food in your mouth, it will become a Yetzirah. You're going to desire food all day long. How about I, money? I, excuse me? How about money? Everything. How much money do you need? You need X amount of money. You have this car, this house, tuition, whatever. You don't need... You now if you want more money so you can give it over, great. But just to have zeros in my bank account? I'll give you a different example. You know, we need to, a, a man needs to be with his wife to procreate. You don't need to be five times with your wife or any other woman. The more you take something you don't need, then you want it more. It's very simple. So, then it becomes, of course, a Yetzirah. Now, what is chametz? Chametz is the same ingredients of, of bread, water, and flour. Flour, if you write it in Hebrew, is chita. Chita in the Torah is written Chet, Tet, Hey. So without, not written with a Yud. Chet, Tet, Hey is, has the numerical value of 22. Chet is 8, Tet is 9, Hey is 5. 22. 22 
These are the 22 letters of Lashon Kodesh. Right? I told you the other day there are 28 letters. Most people ask them how many letters they have in the alphabet, they tell you 22. Some people are a little bit ahead of the game, they tell you 27, because there are five otiot mansapach, mem sofit, nun sofit, and so forth. But, Sefer Etzira says that we have 28 letters. One letter fell down when Adam Arishon sinned, this letter is called Da'at. But nevertheless, we use 22 letters. Chita, chet, tet, hey, numerical value of 22. These are the 22 letters. What are the letters? Kelim. Kelim is a vessel to receive shefa. This is a kli. If you want to give me this beautiful, healthy, luscious, delicious juice, then I need a kli to put it in. If I don't have a kli, what am I going to do? I'm going to drink it like this, but I still I need a kli. The Hebrew letters are kelim, to receive shefa. I need all 22 of them. I can't have only one. Shefa is in abundance. I need a kli to receive a shefa from the world above. Now, chita, flower, it grows from the... It's, it's considered a, a, a vegetation. It's not an animal, it's not an inanimate, and it's definitely not a human. It's come from the level of tzomeach, and it grows. It's considered by our sages a perfect food. Chita, wheat, flour, is considered a perfect... Uh, Perfect food. This is the most perfect food for the, for the human, if it's done in the right way and in the run, right quantity. Now, you take what bread. Bread is made from chita, from wheat, and flour. Same with with chametz. The water will make it inflate, it will make it rise. Matzah, of course, that is, uh, is flat. But bread, it's the same ingredients, but it rises. The water... The water, if you were in the class we had on Monday, if not, maybe you saw it online, I was talking about the four elements. There's the element of water. Every element will, so to say, will create a certain action. Water is equal to pleasure. This is called Yesoda Maim, the element of water. This is where we get pleasure from, where we want pleasure. Some people that their element in their neshama or body is the element of water is powerful, then they're constantly going to grow after pleasures. So the element of water, this is pleasure. The more I give pleasure, the more I give pleasure, then the desire grows. Right? That's how it works. The more you will feed something with pleasure, the more it will want it. Chametz is you take flour, you take water, and you let it grow, grow. Grow, grow, right? That's a Yetzer Ara. Matzah is the same ingredients, but there's a limit up until here. No more. This is Yetzer Tov. Whenever I don't control, I don't put limitations, it will grow and grow and grow and grow. This is Ta'anuk, pleasure. The whole idea of Matzah is something with a limit. How much do you eat? That much. How much do you enjoy? This much. How much of this and this? This much. Limitation. Gvul. That's, you're keeping it under control, Yetzer Tov. You don't keep it under control, it becomes a Yetzer Hara. Just remember these major rules. It will affect your life and change your life. The more you feed something, the more you want it, the more you feed it that it will give you pleasure, right away it turns into Yetzer Hara. Just remember that pleasure in an excessive amount will become a Yetzer Hara. And it will be used against you. Not to, to get too personal in people's life, a little bit of PG-13, but a man is with his wife. The more he will be with her, the more pleasure he receives, him, her, same thing, the more the, the desire, the etzara in this will grow. Not in the Kedusha, this is something holy. So anything you give too much without control and you receive pleasure becomes a etzara. So now we're starting a new year, a new spiritual year then it means a new ratzon, a new desire, a new will. And I need to know how to not let this ratzon grow too much. Anything that you let to grow too much, again, will become a yetzerara. You have a beautiful garden, you call the gardener, he starts trimming everything. Why? If not, it will become a jungle. You need to trim it, you need to keep it under control. You have hair, after a while, you let it grow, it becomes a mess. You have to go to the barber, he starts cutting it, making it trim. Sa the whole the same idea. You let something grow out of control, it becomes out of control in a Yetzirah. Now, you need a house, just to move a little bit forward and faster, you need a house seven days without, without uh, uh, chametz. The whole house has to be without chametz. 
That's why the house has to be cleaned. That's why I have to check the chametz before that. But the whole house has to have chametz, and the house is very powerful. People don't understand how powerful their own house is. My energy is in the house. Everywhere that I go, I carry the energy of the house with me. That's why we want a holy house. That's why we put mezuzot in our house. You know, if you're looking at the mezuzot, the word mezuzah, people think it's just a decoration. Mezuzah is so powerful that not only that it's protecting the house, it's protecting you when you go out of the house. If you have a powerful mezuzah in the house and the house is holy, when you pr go out of the house, it will protect you. That's why you... Look, look at the word mezuzah. If you break the word in Hebrew, it's zaz mavet. Look at the letters in mezuzah. Right? Mem, zayn, vav, zayn, hey. Spread the words. It's zaz mavet. If you move chas v'shalom the wrong way without your mezuzah, mavet brings death. Chas v'shalom. It can be a spiritual death. So, why do I need a clean house? First of all, I need to take all the klipot from out of me. Believe it or not, when I clean my actual house, I mean, you can have the cleaning lady do the majority of it, but you want to also clean at least your personal things, whatever. You clean the house, you get the klipot out of you. I have to do what's called a sumerah. Sumerah is move away from evil. Now, the night before Pesach, how are you? Night before Pesach, I start cleaning the, I, I go through the chametz, and I do what's called biur chametz. I separate all the chametz. I remove it from any existence in my house. How do I do it? I do it with a candle. It's very important. I'm not going to have time now to go through why we do that. I have here the CDs here of Pesach taken. I explain a lot mystically why a candle, why a feather. Why a spoon, if you know the whole rules how to do it? This is not some invention. It's not that somebody sat 2,000 years ago and it says, how are we going to annoy them on the night of Pesach? <laughs> There's a spiritual significance for that. You clean with a candle. It's very important. The candle represents the neshama. And uh, my neshama, my ruach. And then starts the process of cleaning. Now... With the candle, with the light of my neshama, it's how I start looking for the klipot within me. I have to look in the klipot in me and then get it out. You do it in that time. And again, the immune system for the rest of the year. So physically, you walk around with a candle and clean. But also you have to understand that emotionally, mentally, spiritually, I have to look in the klipot in me. What is the klipa in me? How much hate do I have towards other people? How much resentment? How much jealousy? How much judgmental feelings? What is the klipa in me? It has to be klipot in me. I have to look for it with the light of my neshama so I can remove it. Now, then I do what's called bitul chametz. I have to annul the chametz, the, 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 anything that's chametz in my life. Which means I have to levatel the yetzer I have to annul the yetzer anything that is evil in me. How do we do it? We wake up in the morning, we burn the chametz, we read a certain uh, uh, paragraph. This has to be done six hours into the day, not past the six hours into the day. We're not going to go through all the rules right now. I'm just going through a little bit of the stages. And then we burn the chametz in me. You have to follow. That's what I told you. You don't have to understand at this point what you're doing. Follow the rules. Whatever the, the, the rules tell you, just follow them. Don't ask questions right now. You want to ask questions? I told you. The CD is here for Pesach. Go to my website. I have hours over hours over hours explaining the, the significance here. But now just follow the rules. Follow the rules. Our sages already explained to us what we need to do. Next. The night of Pesach is called Lel Shimurim. Shimurim means protection or guardians. You know what I'm protected from? Anything that's coming from the outside. This is called in the Kabbalistic term, Chitzonim. Something that's coming from the outside to affect me. This is the night that I'm protected. All I need to do is follow the rules. Now, very, very, very important is that on uh, 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 the entire week of Pesach, there's no chametz. And uh, if I follow everything that I'm just telling now, including what's going on on Pesach, there's a great segula, uh, remedy, given by Shimshon from Astropoli. And he says that you are guaranteed that you're going to be saved from any type of weird death 
or any type of michshol, something that will chas v'shalom make you fail or, tra- or, or fall, if you are following every little detail in Pesach. Right? I know a lot of it is hard. I know it's a lot of stress before Pesach. But if you follow everything, he says, Muvtachro, you are guaranteed two things. Inatzel mi mita mishuna, will be saved from a weird death. And not only that, inatzel mi kol michshol. Anything that will come to make you fail in any type of a way. Now, Erev Pesach, it's extremely important that you don't necessarily waste it on nothing. You learn. You finish your, your uh, cleaning and everything, you still learn Torah. Now, just to go a little bit for, forward, because we're mamash, uh, it's taking a long time. On the Seder Pesach, very important, you need four cups of wine. This is one of the most important things of the night. You want wine, not grape juice, not white wine. You want good kosher wine. If the wine is too harsh for you, mix it a little bit with grape juice. But you want wine. There's a lot of mystical significance to that. You want four wines, four cups of wines. Now you have a keara in front of you. You have a plate in front of you. Important to know, you do not eat from the keara. Whatever you put on the keara, on the dish, is not to be eaten. Anything else you need to eat is around you. The keara is, you don't touch it. Some have, people have the custom the next day to eat from it, but we don't eat from it. The next day, I mean the day, not the next night if you outside of Israel and you do another night. This keara, this dish, this is like a satellite dish. That's what it is. Satellite dish, you point it to the right direction, it starts receiving. That's how you have to imagine it. This is a satellite dish. Quickly, we're going to go a little bit about the satellite dish because if you know how to organize it the right way, it's pointed to the right direction, you start receiving messages, frequencies. So this keara has ten parts to it. Ten parts, why? Corresponding to ten sfirot. This keara is the vessel to pull to it, to receive all the lights that are shining on Pesach. I don't have the keara. Something is messed up, I will not receive the lights of Pesach. End of story. Now, the halakha, it's enough to have one keara for the entire table. Some people have the custom, they make their own keara, that's fine too. But one keara for the entire table is fine, and again, the keara, the dish, is the satellite, is the tool, the kli, the vessel to receive all the lights that are shining on Pesach. You mess this up, or you don't have it, you're not going to receive anything. Now, very quickly, what do we have here? We have ten parts of it. We have a keara, three matzot, and six simanim, six parts. Again, corresponding to ten sfirot. Three matzot, chokhmah binayin da'at, the mochin, the intellect. Six simanim, I have what's called an uh, upper triangle and a bottom triangle. Magen um, David. The first triangle, the upper triangle, is called Chesed Gvurat Iferet. The lower triangle is called Netzach Hod Yesod. And then the Keara itself, that's the Malchut. That's holding everything. Now, very, very important to know, the order is extremely important. Very quickly to, to explain. If you're looking at the Keara, it has three on one side, three on the other side. The right side is what's called Kava Yamin, left side is called Kava Small. On the right side, the top right is Zroa, is a piece of meat. This corresponds to Chesed. Underneath it, on, sorry, on the next side will be an egg, Beitza. This corresponds to Gevura. This is the, why is this, why Dafka an egg? If, I mean, I know we're kind of short in time, I want to go through it quickly, but why dafka egg? Because this is the only food in the entire world that when you cook it, it becomes hard. Everything else you cook becomes soft. Egg is the only thing that will, if you cook, it will come hard. So again, left side is gvura, that's the beitza, the egg. Then you have in the middle, maror. Maror is tiferet. Why dafka maror? Maror is what makes things bitter. You would think that tiferet should be something sweet. Why dafka bitter? Why dafka maror? And that's the tiferet. Maror has the gematria of the word mavet, death, right? Mem vav taf. I need to chew it and chew it and chew it and chew it till it becomes not bitter anymore, till it becomes sweet. Most people <coughs> inhale it just to be. Uh, he, I ate it. You have to. <coughs> to bite it, and bite it, and bite it, 
till it would lose its bitterness. Then you have on the right side Netzach. Netzach is Charoset. How do you call it Charoset in English? Chain. Horseradish. Horseradish. No? Charoset. Ah, you just said with an English accent. Haroset. Okay. So Charoset is uh, Netzach. Then you have the Karpas. This is Hod. And uh, then you have the Chazeret. I think the Chazeret is the horseradish, right? That's Yisod. That's, the, that's the, the order of the Keara, which is important to know. Now, in the beginning of the Seder, it's when I start pulling lights into this world. This is called, what's called Meshichat Or. Pulling lights, holy lights. And where does it come from? From the Darga that is called Yechaya. There are five levels to the soul, from the bottom to the top. Nefesh, Ruch, Neshama, Chaya, Echida. I pull a light from the Sefirah of Bina to what's called Dargat Yechaya. That's what's going on throughout the Seder. Now, at this point, the Neshama, so to say, has a rebirth. Neshama noledet mechadash, has a rebirth. Hit Chadshut. It's not that it's recreated. It's, so to say, factory setting. Now it's rebirth. You're getting it cleaned at that point. The next day, the slide disappears. That's why Israel is much, much more powerful. But, 49 days I have to start pulling the light back again. The light shines first time on Pesach. Again, coming from Sfirat Abina, shining Bedargat Chaya. Then it disappears. Now I have 49 days to build Kelim, to build vessels. Every day, I build one Kli. I do it the right way. The light returns again on the night of Shavuot. And this will be already Bedargat Or Yechida. This will be already, we talked about it in the beginning of the class, will affect already the Yechida Sheba Nefesh, the highest level of the Neshama. And that will come back to me on Shavuot according to how I did my Lel Seder. If I messed up my Lel Seder, I kind of messed up the entire Sfirat Omer and Shavuot. So it starts in Lel Seder. I have 49 days to build Kelim. Every day I build one Kli, one vessel comes Shavuot, and I receive the light in completion. Now, what does the Neshama birth on that night? It's birthing something very powerful. What gives birth in this world? A mother and a father. We have two things that we need to concentrate on the night of the Pesach, and that's matzot and wine. These are the highlight. The matzah corresponds to the father. The wine corresponds to the mother. Tehav, I'll explain what I mean. Lel Seder, I do a tikkun, a rectification to the root, to the essence of anything that has to do with eating and talking. This is the most powerful night to do tikkun for sins that I did with eating, eating not kosher, and anything that was damaged with my mouth. Lashon hara, lying, slandering, cheating, cursing. That night is the tikkun is done in its root, in its shoresh. Very powerful night. We see, where do we see connection here? That Chava, the first woman in our history, her name is Chaya, but <coughs> nevertheless we know her as Chava, she spoke and she ate. She did two sins. She told Adam Arishon to eat and she ate herself. So she damaged two things, speaking and, uh, and eating. I spoke about on Sunday how this is the most powerful and the most destructive tool that we have. If a person knows to control what goes in and what goes out of this little hole, he's going to be a very happy, successful, healthy individual. This is the, the cause of all the problems. What goes in and what goes out. Now, the tikkun, the rectification for that is eating on Lel Seder. Eating on Lel Seder according to the Seder. The Seder is very vital. This will create a tikkun. And unfortunately, we all suffer from that because we all suffer, we all fail in achalot ma, ma achalot asurot, in th food that is not right. And we all fail, of course, with lying and slandering and cheating and so forth. Now, why is that important? Because <coughs> I'm able to reach this rectification. A very important thing, you know, if you're looking at the seder, if you have kids, or if, even, even if you don't, but the highlight of the little seder is the kids. If you know, you have to show it to your next generation. And the most important thing is what you're giving to the next generation, that there's order in life. This is where you're kind of programming in your mind. has to be order. If I don't have order, 
I will, it will not work out. Shacharit, you pray in the morning, not at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's how it works. Some people pray at Shacharit at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. For whatever reason. There's time to do everything. Sedel. That's why we have a time for Shacharit, a time for Mincha, a time for Arvit. There's a certain time you wash for bread, there's a certain time that you have opportunity to say Bracha after that you lost the opportunity. We have to understand that we have to have order in our life. Now, just to move on forward a little bit. We have to drink four cups of wine. This is corresponding to what's called the mochin, the intellect. There are four categories in the mochin, in the intellectual part, intellectual part of the neshama. That's why when we wear tefillin, if you're looking at the tefillin of the head, it's divided into four parashiot, four compartments on the tefillin of the head. Tefillin of the head is one. Tefillin of the head is four. Why? Because it's four parts of the mochin, of the intellectual part of the neshama. So we drink four cups of wine. Somebody not too long ago asked me, can you explain to me why we drink the four cups? I told him very briefly, this is a long explanation, corresponding to four parts of our neshama, nefesh ruach, neshama chayichida, that our neshama is climbing from the world of Asiya to the world of Yotzira, to the world of Briyat, till it reaches the world of Atzilut this is on that night. also have four? The, yeah, that's one of the many reasons, yeah. Now, every cup has a certain energy. So it's very important how you drink it, not stand wasted. That's why I said you do not want to use cheap wine or grape juice. Wine, good wine. Every cup has a certain energy. And all these energy, this Heara, is coming from the Sphira of Bina. And again, I'm now throwing some information. You don't have to memorize it and you definitely don't have to understand it. You need to follow the Seder. When do you drink? When do you put the cup down? When do you move the Matzah? When do you bring the Matzah? When you break the Matzah? Just do it like a parakeet, like a, I don't want to say the word monkey, but you have to follow every rule here. Now, what is the four cups representing? Removing the nefesh from its imprisonment. That's where you have to, if you want, take after that notes from the class, from the video. The cups is representing that it's removing the nefesh mima'asar. That's what it does, it's removing the nefesh from its imprisonment. Which, of course, will correspond to, in our life, to Simcha. Most people are not happy because their nefesh is stuck in Ma'asar, in prison. If your nefesh is revealed, then you're not going to have any problems with Simcha. That's what the clip are you talking about earlier. Exactly. Exactly. Now, we have four kosot of wine, and we have also four parts of the matzah. So we have the three matzot, but don't forget that in the middle one, we break in half. Really, we have four parts that we eat of the matzah. Each one has to be 29 grams. You don't have to put it on the scale on that night. It's about this big, about your size of your hand. That's about the kezai that you need to eat. This is about, this has to be not less than 29 grams. The, the measurement, so eat around the size of your hand, a little bit bigger. That's what you need to eat. Very important that you eat it in time, the right uh, 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 speed. Now again, the four parts of the matzah will correspond to the four parts of the mochin that are called Abba. I will explain that very soon also, very uh, briefly. So we have 15 stages of the sedel. The first one is we do Kadesh, we do Kiddush. This uh, year, it's also going to be Kiddush for Shabbat. And this is, as a side note, it's good if one person pours to the other. Don't pour for yourself. Why? What? No, not for the king. Just a, a long explanation. But better to pour for other people. Sharing. No, excuse me. Sharing. Sharing. Okay, you can share. Now, better, <laughs> better for it to be red wine. Don't, if you can, don't do white wine or sparkly wine. Red wine. I know sometimes people take one wine. Ooh, they're already, already no lama atzilut. <laughs> Better, so sweeten it a little bit, put a little bit of uh, uh, grape juice or something. And it has to be not less than 86 cc. This is called Revi'it. Like this. This is, this is very, very big. Some people have a cup of wine. Oh, the, the, but Revi'it is very, very small. Again, 86 cc. Next part of it is Urchatz. We have to wash our hands. We do it without a bracha. We just wash our hands. Then we have Karpas. Karpas, just very briefly to go through a few things, is representing the nullification of what's called katnut. I'm sure here you, I hope you are learning a little bit about the idea of katnut, or specifically what we're talking about, katnut amokhin. 
Now what we're talking here about, we have two types of mochin, ima and abba. I'll explain it a little bit later if we have more time. But there, there's one part of the mochin that is called abba, one part of the mochin is called ima. Abba and ima is corresponding to chokhmah and bina. Chokhmah is abba, bina is ima. Put ima and abba, man and a woman together, it will birth a child. Chokhmah and bina merge together, they will start birth midot. So you have both mochins on both sides, the Abba and Ima. Karpas is the, the representation or the manifestation of Bitula Katnut. Katnut is a state of limitation that my mind cannot think a little step ahead. So the Karpas, again, it's breaking the Katnut. So then, when we eat it, should we have all these things? If you can, yeah. That's why some people want to have, some people have a Haggadah that has the short version. Some people have a Gadot with all the Perushim, all the Kavanot. What do I need to think of? So there are good uh, Agadot. Would you recommend? Oh, there's so many. Uh, uh, if you want, I, mean, I use a... The regular Haggadah... No, the regular Haggadah is what they give you in the Pesach retreats because they want you to finish quick so you can serve you another course. But uh, you want to get a good Haggadah, I have a good Agadah in Perushim on the sides from the Arizal and the Rashash and good Perushim and Kavanot that you, you don't have to be such a Mekubal the Baba Sari that night. But have the right Kavanah. Okay, now I'm in, t- doing the Karpas. Then let me have the Kavanah. Okay, this is now to Bitula Katnut. No question you want to have a good Haggadah. Uh, uh, and no question that you don't want to rush in this. You want to make sure that you're going through the night. That night is your ticket to freedom. This is not the night to schmooze, talk, wait for the roast, and so forth. If you don't mind, let me just go th- quickly through this, then we'll conclude, and then we'll do all the questions. Next, we have the yachatz. Yachatz is when we break the middle matzah. This is called the afikoman. After that, we do the magid, the haggadah. This is, again, the tikkun for the dibur. I know some, haggad, some people, they read the haggadah. You read a portion, you read a portion. You read a portion, you read a portion. That's very nice. You have to still read the entire Agada. Make sure that you are reading the entire Agada. Believe it or not, it's not important right now how and why. It does a tikkun for dibur. This is the night where you can reach a rectification for all the Lashon Ara, all the lying, all the cheating and so forth. The Agada, again, is presenting the Neshama and the Guf, the body and the, the soul, Israel and Mitzrayim. Constantly is the Israel and Mitzrayim, the relations between the Neshama and the Guf. Now the Agadah is a story, right? How do you say story in Hebrew? Sipur. Sipur comes from the word in Hebrew, Sfirot. Sfirot, the emanation. Sfirot, people think that you're counting. One, two, three. Sfirot are coming from the word in Hebrew, Sapir. Sapir is to in light. These are the Sfirot. Sfirot is not counting. Sfirot is enlightening. Now, when you are saying the story of Pesach, the Sipur, the Sfirot, you are enlightening with a huge, unbelievable light the root of all the Sfirot in my soul. So I just need to read the story. Again, you don't have to understand what you're doing. Read it. While you're reading it, you are enlightening the essence, the root of all the Sfirot in your soul. That's why I have to lesaper be'etziat Mitzrayim. If you're looking at the actual, what they, it says in the Agadah. Now, <clears throat> that night what I do is I pull lights of the Etziat Mitzrayim now for that night. Which means when I'm talking about the Etziat Mitzrayim, the action that I'm doing is I'm pulling out the Neshama from Mitzrayim while reading the story. That's why the whole night is so important. Now comes already after that, we do the meal. Like I told you, it doesn't have to be a seven-course meal. chick chak, eat the meal. Move on for the next part, which is the most important part. This is Chatzi Halel. We read half of Halel. This is the real Halel, by the way. The Halel we read on Rosh Chodesh, that's not the original, um, not original. This is the Rabbanan. Our sages added that to praise Hashem. The real Halel is when they crossed the sea and they went out of Mitzrayim. They praised God. So we read Chatzi Halel. Then we put the next cup. We wash our hands. We eat Matzah and so forth. Uh... How do you eat the matzah? You have to eat 29 grams, the size is more or less of a, a human big hand, not like a baby hand. You have to eat leaning down to the left, and you have to eat it fast. Nine minutes you have to eat, to, to eat it. It's not the time to start schmoozing. You eat it. You finish with it. 
Then we eat the maror with uh, some uh, lettuce and, uh, and uh, it has to be a, a kezait. This is what it does when you're putting the, the lettuce and the maror, this is transforming death into life. That's the idea that you have to understand when you're eating the, the lettuce and the maror. Then we have another part, we call it korech, you make a sandwich, you put the matzah, the, the lettuce inside, maror and so forth. This, you don't eat rushing, you do it slowly. You eat it, and you don't want to eat it too fast. Then, of course, like I said, you do the meal, you uh, eat the afikoman, uh, the, you do another cup with birkat amazon, halel, fourth cup, and so forth, and you go through the entire seder. The point to take from the seder is this is the time that something is happening in the universe, and you are preparing your satellite dish, you're going one step after another step, after another step, after another step. You are start receiving this godly light from Sfirat Abina that is enlightening the mochin, the intellect part, in your neshama that is allowing the neshama to go out of its exile. Now, the fi you're finishing the little saddle, you are already, pff, if you did it right, you're already in Olam HaTzilut. So we read Shira Shirim. You can read highly recommended anything that night. This is already flying in a, in a different uh, altitude. We don't even say Kirat Shema that night because we're in such a high level. Now we want to preserve it throughout the seven days. And you have 49 days to build Kelim, to build vessels every day. So that light will return on Shavuot and you receive it in a much more profound way. What's the point of all that? Again, and you don't have to understand what you're doing. If you want to understand, that's great. Just do it. This will immune your neshama for the rest of the year to have the mechanism to go out of its slavery whenever something triggers it. Then you're becoming a ben chorim, a free person for the rest of the year. That's what you want to have. This is the bottom line here. That I do not want to live in exile. I do not want to live my, have my neshama in Mitzrayim. I want my neshama to constantly be going out of Mitzrayim. We went through many, many details what can preserve it, what can affect it, and what can help. But the point is that I have to understand that my neshama is stuck in Mitzrayim needs to be released. So what I want to take from that is from Rosh Chodesh, from this Shabbat, is I start preparing. I start cleaning the chametz. I start looking inside of me. What, am I, what is the klipot inside of me? I have too much anger, too much, too much hate, too much jealousy. I'm judgmental. I'm quick to, to, to judge. I'm quick to get angry. I'm, I'm impatient. Whatever it is, just start looking at the klipot in me. I look at the wrong places. I say the wrong things. I, I'm not honest in business. Whatever it is, you do your own, your own cleaning. So you can come to Pesach and you remove all this klipa, all this dirt from you. Now you're ready to start receiving this light. You want to invest in the next two, three weeks because it will carry you for the rest of the year to be able to constantly go out of your Mitzrayim. You fail, no problem, you get up. You get up and you move on and you go constantly out of your Mitzrayim, even if it's ten times a day, even if it's a hundred times a day. And Bezad Hashem, if we're able to do that, we go out of our own personal exile into our own personal redemption. The result is that I'm happy. I'm truly, truly happy, even if I didn't find my other half yet, even if I don't have money, even if things don't work out. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect my, my, my behavior or my thoughts. People say things, fine. People do things, okay. That's what I want to reach. I don't want to reach to a place where I'm constantly sad, depressed, impatient, unhappy, not satisfied. Everything else will fall exactly to how it needs to. But I have to have the ability to constantly be in a state of, of exile, a state of uh, uh, redemption, a state of uh, geula. And needless to say, when I'm able to reach to that level, besides that I'm happy, successful, healthy. Now again, it doesn't mean that now you become a gazillionaire and everything works out. And that's not what it means. It means that I'm able to deal with my life in a healthy, positive way. And I deal with the struggles and the challenges that Hashem gave me. But more than that, when I'm able to reach to my level of personal redemption, then I'm able to affect the entire world to reach to a state of Geula.
And that's really what I want to focus on. I want to make sure that I, I take something from it for the rest of the year. Your year will be more effective, more productive, better, more successful. But our main goal is that the entire Klal Israel should go out of their Mitzrayim. And we should go, as we say at the end of the Agada, Lishana Ba Yerushalayim. It should be the Shana Azot Ba Yerushalayim. Bezal Hashem, we should see the Gura with their own physical eyes. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'Amen. Rabbi Chanelea ben Akasha Omer, Ratzah Kadosh Bukhul, Lezakot et Yisrael, Fichach Erbalem Torah Mitzvot, Shenehemar, Adonai Chafetz Lema'an Sidko, Yagdil Torah ve'Yadir.